Well, folks, we did it. We made it to a thousand subscribers here on the channel. I couldn't do it without you guys. This is as much your achievement as it is mine. Thank you guys so much for tuning in every week for my full card breakdowns. Not so much on my Ultimate Fighter stuff, but you know, whatever. Hey, thanks for tuning in for all the uh, for all the full card breakdowns. So we're happy that you're here. It's so good to see you guys again. If you th if this is a returning view for you, if you are here for the first time, well, you just came in at the right time because we're celebrating today. We made it over a thousand subscribers on the channel. Or 138 MMA has made it over a thousand subscribers on the channel, and here we go. We're now there. But anyway, because of that, we're celebrating in a different way. I've got a new intro theme. It's going to be coming up right after this, so stay tuned. Check that out. But also, find me on Twitter, as always, 138MMA, Tapology, whatever. You can find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash 138MMA, where you can get access to all my notes. You can get access to the Patreon parlay, as well as an assortment of other neato things. Every now and then, I throw out an Invicta pick or two on there or something like that. But anyway, that's where you can find all this stuff. Now, check out this sweet new intro right before we get into UFC Vegas 74 for a full card breakdown starting with the prelims, working all the way up to the main event. Stay tuned. You guys are going to love it. Let me know what you think of the intro. My good buddy, uh, Coltero and the Weird Siders, uh, decided to make this for me. He offered to do so, and you can find his uh, Spotify link in the description as well. Thanks. Check it out. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children. remember how to do this after so much time off we're kicking off the card in the light heavyweight division with felipe Linz taking on maxine grishin now for maxine grishin he's two two in a draw in his last five three and two on the Linz side let's start with grisham in this one here so for grisham good striking he's kind of that patient kind of look for his opportunity look for his shots kind of guy uh but he's going to be very defensively sound and then he's going to just kind of slam leg kicks that are brutally powerful leg kicks and that's kind of his style in the striking look for the hands when he's got the op opportunity but the leg kicks are probably what's going to be his best bet in this matchup here now he does have decent takedown defense but if he does get taken down he's going to struggle off of his back especially in this matchup going up against felipe lens let's start down at the bottom here he has good brazilian jiu-jitsu especially when he's on top because that top pressure it's pretty heavy and against a guy that struggles off his back already this is a decent spot for lens now when it comes to the striking, he's going to have that forward pressure. He's going to throw a lot of volume, and he's going to throw some decent power. The problem is his striking defense, because he'll come in and he'll throw that volume and power, kind of leaving his hands down, especially when he goes to exit the pocket. If he hasn't knocked the guy out, which he will do, he's going to leave that chin wide open for the counter shot, and Maxim Grisham is a guy that can get that done. Now, how do I see this fight going? I see it going one of two ways. Either Linz is able to get on top, win that way, pound out Grisham because he can't get back to his feet. Linz comes in heavy, wins it with the with a knockout shot, or I guess it's one of three ways, or Maxim Grisham. Grisham's gonna come, just kinda stand there, be cautious, use his striking defense, hammer the leg kicks, look for the opportunities, catch a few counter shots on Lens, and eventually either wear him out and get the finish late or win a decision. For me, I'm gonna take Grisham, but I'm not super, super confident in it. Maxim, Maxim Grisham is not somebody I would want to bet on, especially especially in a matchup like this where we got a guy like Felipe Lins who is going to kind of throw a wrench into the mix, make things a little bit wild. But Christian's a pick because I do make picks on this channel and that's what we're going to do. Let me know what you guys have. I'd love to see, hear who your lock of the card is. So drop it down in the comments and I'll see you next yet that There's a lot of really close matchups on this card because we have another one here in the bantamweight division. We have Damon Blackshear taking on Luan Lacerda. Now, for Lacerda, he's 4-1 in the last five, 3-1 in a draw for Blackshear. Now, real quick, if you've made it this far in the video and you are enjoying yourself, I appreciate it kindly. If you head on down and hit that like button for me, I appreciate it so much. It does help the channel. And you know what? Thank you for doing that. I appreciate that. Let's go back to the video. Damon Blackshear, good wrestling. He has the kind of submission over position style. He's going to be chasing the chokes. And you know what? He does have a very good choking game. Now, he's going to be out looking for those chokes when he gets a hold of your neck he's got it but the problem is sometimes he chases the submission and loses the position it's okay it's neutral you know you're either position over submission or submission over position and both of them have their pros and cons so it's neutral but the chokes very good now when he's on the striking striking game he's got a lot of power in his hands the guy's going to use you know some pretty good technique but the power is there and i think the power is important against a guy like lacerda and we'll cover that in a second 
Also, Black Chair does have the ability to rally late. If he is down, he will push forward and kind of just bite down on the mouthpiece and go. So that's another thing you like to see. Now for Lacerda, probably the better striker, I guess. Maybe not technically, but like uh, damaging wise, I guess. I Either way, dude's a powerful striker. He's going to come forward with wild pressure, just reckless abandon. Um, but he's got good volume, and the kicks are his kind of best weapon when he's doing that. He's throwing kicks from all odd angles, all sorts of good stuff. But the problem is his striking defense, and that's what I was talking about with the power of Blackshear. Well, Serda could get dropped. Now, if he gets dropped, it's okay because he's got good jujitsu. As long as he doesn't get knocked out cold, he's got good jujitsu. So if the fight does end up on the mat, a very large toolbox for Lacerda. He's going to be able to sweep from the bottom, transition into side control, transition into mount, whatever he's got to do. And he's going to seek that finish, whether it be via ground and pound or the submission, most likely the submission, but maybe also via ground and pound. The problem is his open mat takedowns aren't really there. So to be able to use his jujitsu, he has to get in the clinch where he does have decent clinch takedowns. But like I said, the open mat takedowns are, they leave a lot to be desired. So if this fight goes to the mat, it's going to be decided by Blackshear. But on the feet, it's a close fight. And that's where I think this is going to take place for the majority of the time, because I don't think Blackshear is going to shoot a lot of takedowns. And I don't think Lacerda is going to get a lot of takedowns. I think it's going to be Lacerda crashing forward with his wild, wild pressure and the power of Blackshear trying to make, make Lacerda regret that. And we're going to see where it ends up. I'm going to take Lacerda. But like I said, it's a really close matchup. I wouldn't fault you for taking Blackshear. Let me know what you have, and I'll see you in the next Straw fight. Weights takes center stage in this matchup here. We have Elise Reed taking on Jin Yu Fry. Now, both ladies are two and three in their last five. Reed is the younger fighter at 30 years old, and we have 38 on the Fry side. Now, here's the deal, guys. This is going to be a matchup where somebody's probably going to win, but as far as the pick, I just throw my hands in the air and say, I don't know. But we're going to try and break this down, and we're going to try to come to a conclusion. And my conclusion is probably going to be made based on what I talked myself into in this matchup. So let's we'll start with Fry on her striking. She has decent striking. She's going to come forward and throw a combination. She's just going to move forward, throw a good three or four punches, move forward, throw three or four punches or whatever. All in the, the goal typically is to get the cage push going. She has decent wrestling. The cage push is where she excels. So she's going to come forward with that striking. That's what she's going to do. Now for Elise Reed, what we're going to see, well, she has that Taekwondo background. So I don't know if any of you took Taekwondo as a child, at least, you know, maybe as an adult, but as a child, you probably remember. Taekwondo is a defensive art. So there's a lot of moving backwards and throwing strikes while moving backwards because you're trying to use defense, not so much offense. Yes, you can move forward in Taekwondo. I understand that there are, you know, tournaments and things like this or whatever. Taekwondo at its core is a defensive art though. So you're a lot of times gonna be moving backwards while you're striking. So she's going to have the range striking ability and that's what we're gonna see. We're gonna see a lot of Fry coming forward, Reed moving backward, and that's what we're going to get, at least from my, my estimations on the striking. Now, usually the fighter moving backward is losing, but not necessarily. So there is that. Now, if Fry is able to land a takedown, Reed's takedown defense isn't very good, and she is easily held down by a lot of her opponents. So there is that, but, but a big one here, uh, Natural atom weight for Fry. What does that mean? That means she used to compete at 105 pounds and she probably still would be doing so, except for the fact that UFC does not have a 105 pound division. So she moved up to straw weight at 115 and that's where she's at in this matchup. Elise Reed is going to be the stronger fighter, more likely than not. In fact, Fry is almost always going to be the smaller, weaker fighter, um, just physically because she's not a very big woman. And that's not really her fault. She was born that way, more or less. Yeah, she can pack on muscle, yada, yada. You get the point. But at least Reed's probably going to be the stronger, more physical fighter. And she's got good cardio and durability to go along with that. So I do think the physical advantages are going to be on the Reed side. Now, the problem with Reed, she's super inconsistent. We don't know what we're going to get here. I hate picking inconsistent fighters, but I do think that the size is going to play a difference. And I think it's going to matter quite a bit. And I think at least Reed, even though moving backwards, she's probably going to be able to do more damage when she lands. Ah, I got the slightest lean towards Elise Reed. But yeah, super, super not confident whatsoever. There's a lot of those on this card. I'm sorry. I know a lot of you guys get mad at me when I just say I'm not confident in a pick. But are you confident in this? If you're confident in this fight and you've got a confident pick, get, put, put it down there with the name of the fighter and the little lock emoji or whatever next to it. And let me know because I'm not confident whatsoever. Let me know what you got and I'll see you in the next matchup fight. That's actually been shuffled around a bit. A few weeks ago, this was scheduled and uh, Daniel Santos had to pull out Sounded like an injury or something like that, but I don't know for sure. Something like that. Uh, anyway, now here we are at bantamweight. We've got Daniel Santos taking on Johnny Munoz Jr. Both guys three and two in the last five. 
Johnny Munoz Jr. being the taller, longer fighter at 5'9 with a 71 inch reach as opposed to 5'7, 67 inch reach. Now, there's a lot up here. We've already covered this once before in the original matchup. I've already got the video up there. I'm going to break this one down again, but we're going to talk a little bit fast. So let's start with Daniel Santos. He's probably the better striker here. I don't actually, I don't say he's definitely the better striker here. He's got powerful striking. He does spin a lot, which can be bad because I don't know, spinning gets just, it opens you up, but he, he does effective with his spins a lot of the time. His spinning sidekick is particularly deadly. He has pretty good knees and he'll throw them up the middle, which against a guy that wants to get you to the mat, that does make them second guess things because, well, there's a knee coming up the middle. And if you're going to try and shoot a takedown right down the middle, well, that's just a bad idea. Now, he also has pretty darn good leg kicks. He's going to come forward, slam those leg kicks while he's throwing the uh, powerful strikes with his hands and throwing in the spinning side kicks as the opponent starts to back away. Typically, that's how it's going to look, but you know, whatever. He does get hit a bit on the feet, but I don't think he has to worry too much. Johnny Munoz Jr., who, yeah, he's okay at striking. He just isn't, he isn't, a, it, striking's not his game, okay? Uh, wait, let's go ahead and break down his striking now. So his striking, like I said, is decent. He likes to use his kicks, a lot of like front kicks and side kicks at range, long straight punches, and he'll put out a decent amount of volume, but not really a threat in the striking department. So when it comes up to the striking, obviously Santos is the better of the two, but when it comes to the grappling, that's a little bit different. Now it's, it's close because Daniel Santos, good jujitsu. He's active off his back, but sometimes he does get held down and that can be a problem because you can lose minutes that way. Now, when I put this video out the first time, when I broke this down the first time, uh, someone someone was upset or whatever that I, I, uh, I originally picked Santos and I gave Johnny Munoz a chance at winning by saying that he has good jujitsu. Uh, I'm gonna play both sides because that's what I do. I'm like, I'm always gonna give you both sides. So that's what we're doing here. Johnny Munoz Jr. He has very slick Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. The transitions are there. So if he gets you to the mat, he can move through his positions. And I, I'm going to, you know, fight me on this in the comments if you want. I think Johnny Munoz has the better Jiu-Jitsu just, just in the sense of grappling, purely grappling. If you start adding strikes, you start adding the stand-up and things like that, getting the fight to the mat, that changes things quite a bit. But just pure Jiu-Jitsu for Jiu-Jitsu, I will say Johnny Munoz Jr. has a little bit better. Now, he's going to snatch up arms. That's what he's looking for. And to get the fight to the mat, he's going to catch kicks. That's what he does a lot. Now, when you have a guy that kicks a lot, this is one of the things I got crap for last time. When you have a guy that kicks a lot and a guy that catches kicks, it just makes sense that, it, that he has a chance of catching a kick. I'm not just saying crazy stuff here, all right? So he does, he does catch a lot of kicks. If you go back and watch his tape, he's gotten a lot of fights to the mat that way. But when he does get it to the mat, he's going to start working his ground and pound in order to set up a submission. So very skilled in the grappling department. Now, obviously, he's going against a guy that's pretty skilled in the grappling department as well, so that does change things a bit. Now, his wrestling, he's more of a trip and body lock guy, but he does have a single leg that's pretty darn nice in his back pocket. He just doesn't use it very often. So, in this matchup here, I think Santos has more, more likelihood of winning with his path to victory because it's going to be hard for Johnny Munoz Jr. to get this fight to the mat unless he does catch that kick, like I say. Uh, Daniel Santos, obviously the better striker, the two, the more damaging striker. And I think he's going to put a, a lot of pre uh, pressure and pace on a guy like Munoz early on in a fight. And I think that's going to be tough for him to handle. So I'm still going to pick Santos. I am much less confident in Santos than I was last, last, not last week, but last time this fight was a few weeks back, simply because it sounds like he was the one that pulled out. I don't know what was going on there. So to make the long story short, I'm picking Santos. Johnny Munoz has a real possibility to win this fight. Fight me in the comments if you want. Let me know what you guys have, and I'll see you on the next one. Time for the heavyweights. We have Andre Arlovsky taking on Dante Mays. Now, for Dante Mays, he is 2-2-1 two, two, and one, no contest in the last five. That no contest is to Hamdi Abdel Wahab, which he lost that fight. But uh, Hamdi popped for the steroids, so, you know, got a no contest there. On the other side, we have Andre Arlovsky. He's 4-1 in his last five. Now, physically, Dante Mays all of it he's six foot six with an 81 inch reach as opposed to the six three seventy seven inch reach of arlovsky he's only 31 years of age as opposed to the 44 for arlovsky skill for skill arlovsky's gonna be the better fighter here we'll start with Dante Mays though he has decent striking movements all right power is pretty decent not such good striking defense but he's got that judo background and it makes for his cage push and kind of dirty boxing from the cage push that ends up being pretty good so he's all right Andre Olovsky, on the other hand, yeah, he slowed down a little bit in his career, but he still has a lot of things like the good striking. He's still got good volume. He's got movement. He's And the leg kicks and the counter striking. What he's going to do is he's going to throw that leg kick, hit your leg, get you to try to counter that leg kick by throwing a punch at him, which is going to work out great here because Dante Mays likes to box. 
So he's going to throw that leg kick, get you to try to come back, and then he's going to hit you with counters and just win fights by doing that. He's used that fight IQ that he has to do just enough to win rounds, and that's how Andre Olovsky has put together a 4-1 and one in his last five record as opposed to the 2-2-1 two, two, and one for Dante Mays. Now, the one other thing that's interesting here is Andre Olovsky's got pretty good takedown defense. So if Dante Mays was able to get on top of Arlovsky, because he is a much bigger guy at, in the heavyweight division, big range in weight that you can be. Mays is going to be bigger, all right? If he was able to get on top of Arlovsky, yeah, that'd probably be a bad round for Arlovsky. But Arlovsky's got pretty darn good takedown defense, and I think he's going to be able to stand there, outpoint Dante Mays on the feet, and I think Arlovsky's going to win a decision. The over in this fight's probably an all right one, unless... Orlovsky gets chin checked because there is some decent power on the May side, but I feel pretty good about Orlovsky. I'm taking him. I've bet him in almost every one of his last five fights. Um, I bet him in all four of those wins he's got, even the one where he ripped off uh, Jake Collier, and I'll take that win because it was a freebie. Uh, and you know what? Every now and then, you just you just luck out. So I like Orlovsky here. I think he probably gets this done over a guy that I don't really think is quite at the level of the crafty vet in Arlovsky. Let me know what you guys have, and I will so see we you We find next. ourselves in the bantamweight division. We have John Castaneda taking on Muin Gafarov. Now, for Gafarov, he's 3-2. and two. Castaneda, also 3-2. and two. But for Gafarov, he's stepping in on short notice, which I meant to write right here, but clearly I, you can tell I'm rusty. We've been off for a week, so, you know, whatever. I forgot to write short notice. So he's stepping in on short notice to take on John Castaneda, who is a very tough opponent, because what he's going to do is he's going to come forward with a ton of volume, and he's going to just kind of strike after strike after strike after strike and then mix in a takedown and then, you know, th he just kind of put it all together. And that's that's what we're going to get out of Castaneda. You know what's coming. His striking defense isn't always the best, but you know he's going to put forward a ton of volume. And Gafarov, on the other hand, he's going to come forward with some power. What he's going to do is he's going to sling power shots, big overhands, big looping hooks, things like that. But he leaves himself wide open to be countered by a guy like Castaneda when he does so. But he'll also mix in the wrestling. When he gets on, on top from the wrestling, what he's going to do is he's going to look to take the back and win minutes, kind of grind on our opponent, wear on him there. But here's the deal. This is a very close matchup and a very tough one. I don't know how I want to want to go on this one. I've This is the hardest one on the, on the entire card for me. I'm going to pass entirely, but I will I will make a pay, pick for the sake of the video. But as far as like betting and everything, I'm passing entirely. This is a hard, hard, hard fight for me. I'm going to just slightly lean Gafarov. I'm going to take the new hot commodity to come in and get the get the win here on short notice. I think I think the short notice nature of this fight does cause him a few problems, but I do think it also is going to be something that he can use to his advantage because Kachinato was not preparing for a guy like Gafarov. So maybe that, that style changes things a little bit. And with the lack of striking defense from Castaneda, he does get hit a lot. One of those power shots lands, we got a problem for Castaneda. So... Gavrov's a pick, but yeah, seriously, zero confidence. I'll see you guys in the next close fight. matchup in the welterweight division. We have a Bubakar and Magomedov taking on Alessio Zaleski dos Santos. Uh, for Zaleski, he's three and two in his last five, three one and a draw for Nurmagomedov. Interesting matchup here. Okay, we're gonna start with the Zaleski side as he is right here next to me. So we're gonna start with that. He is the better striking in this matchup for sure. Now here's the deal: solid striking with the volume and the power. That's what he's got. He's got some wild attacks sometimes. But the kicks are what get it done. The problem is kicks against a grappler or a wrestler sometimes can leave you exposed. Now, what he has that changes the game a bit are the knees up the middle. Because knees up the middle, unlike kicks, which can be you know caught or timed for a takedown, knees up the middle, yes, they can be caught, but also give wrestlers pause because, well, if you're shooting a takedown and there is a knee coming right up the middle as you've already committed to that takedown, it could be the end of your night. So the knees of the middle and the kicks used in tandem here do help out in a matchup where he's going to fight Nurmagomedov, who does have pretty darn good wrestling. Now, in the event that this fight ends up on the ground, Zaleski does have good jiu-jitsu, but unfortunately for him, it's typically when he's on top that it looks good, and when he's on the bottom, he can just kind of be held there, and uh, it's not, not really such a good thing for him, especially against a guy like Nurmagomedov. Now, for Nurmagomedov, Decent boxing. He's got the footwork. He's going to be pumping the jab out there. The problem is he's way outmatched in the striking department, but he does have solid wrestling, good takedowns, and a lot of top pressure once he does get on top. The problem is sometimes he leaves his neck exposed when he shoots a takedown. Hasn't come back to bite him really too much yet, but, uh, you know, it's there in the event that Zaleski is able to take advantage of it. So here's what I see, okay? Just lost the magnet that was on the side of this, so don't worry about that. I see this in the striking department for uh, Zaleski. 
and I see this in the grappling department for Magomedov. So what does it come down to? Do you favor the striking or the grappling? Now, if you've watched this channel for a while, typically you know that I tend to favor wrestlers over strikers. Why is that? Because wrestlers typically dictate where the fight takes place, whether that's because they're using the wrestling to keep the fight standing or using the wrestling to get to the mat. So for me in this one, although it's a very close fight, and I can see it going either way, I'm going to take Abubakar Namagamadov because I like the wrestling upside of him. So for me, the pick's Abubakar Namagamadov, but let me know what you have. If you've got a strong take for Zaleski, I could be swayed. Let me know, and I'll see you in the next fight. Along to the lightweights, we have Jamie Malarkey coming in, taking on Guram Kutatsaladze. Both guys 4-1 and one in their last five fights. Now, here we go. This is an interesting matchup because... We have for Kutal Taladze, I'm probably gonna mess up the name, bear with me. He's got good forward pressure and he has solid striking. Volume and power are there, but the kicks, the kicks are what get it done for him. He has excellent kicking game. Uh, takedown defense, pretty good. And if he does get taken down, he's gonna work back to his feet so we can get back into this striking because realistically, Kutal Taladze is going to be the better striker in most matchups. Now he's going up against D uh, Jamie Malarkey, who interesting in this one because his last fight kind of bucks the trend. Now, typically, he's a decent striker with a lot of volume, combinations. Striking defense isn't there, but he's just going to kind of eat a lot of damage and kind of wear on his opponents and break them just by absorbing damage while throwing back. Now, last fight, he was much more defensive, and that was not the game plan whatsoever. So, who knows? Maybe we've got a brand new Jamie Malarkey, or maybe that was a one-off. So, big question mark there, but we don't know. We're going we're gonna to go with what we do know, and that what we've seen in the past on the, uh, the the bulk of his performances. We can't just take the last performance and think, oh, that's the new one, unless we have a reason to believe so. For me, I think it was a, a strange performance. I think he just needed the win, and that's where we're at. So, decent wrestling. He will mix in the takedowns when it's needed. I don't think the takedowns are going to be good enough to get Kudatsaladze down. I could be wrong. Um, yeah, could be wrong. Slow starter for Malarkey, though. It's going to be... I. Guys, I think Kudat Delazes get this one done. I think he's better pretty much everywhere. Um, I think he's a better striker. I think the striking defense of Malarkey, yeah, he's got a good chin. I think it's, you know, I think it's going to get tested here. And I think Kudat Delazes is probably going to get the win. I don't know if it's my finish, but I think he's going to get the win. So I'm not going to bet the over-under or anything like that. I'm going to take Kudat Delazes. I think he's probably safe for your parlays. I feel good about this one, and darn it, I had a lot of fights on this card that I don't feel good about. So let me know what you've got. And if you're on the Malarkey side, let me know if it's because of that last performance and what you saw in that matchup. I'm looking forward to hearing from you guys in the comments below. And let's see you in the next Flyweights are next. So in this matchup here, actually the under is the spot that I like. I'm going to start it off with that. If it's under two and a half, I kind of like that in this one here because both ladies are going to be coming for a finish. We have Ketlin Souza and Karine Silva. Both are 5-0 and in their last five. And an interesting tidbit... I believe all 15 of Karine Silva's wins are by finish. So, obviously, you know, she's getting it done that way. Uh, this is going to be a matchup where I think that the forward pressure from both ladies is going to make for a very, very volatile matchup. So, let's start with the Silva side. She has excellent grappling. When she gets a hold of her opponent, she's just going to drag them to the mat, just pull them down with her. She's going to start with the nasty ground and pound and then aggressively seek the submissions. Whether she gets the finish with the ground and pound or the submission, she's looking for the, the the finish once she hits the mat. Now, with the feet, she is solid in the Muay Thai department. She's got good power, and she's going to strike in burst. Three, four, five strike combinations. Just come through the burst, move in, move out, whatever. She's going to do that pretty well, and she's usually got a pretty good guard up while she's going into the pocket. So on the Sosa side, though, she's a powerful striker who's just going to come forward, throw heavy punches, throw heavy hands, and slam leg kicks, which are also heavy. Now, if it hits the mat, she's got good Brazilian jiu-jitsu in her own right. She's not as aggressive as someone like Silva, for example, but uh, but she is she is good on the mat as well. This matchup is a tough one to pick the winner, but I do, I find myself, even though I, I look at Souza and I see her skills and I think, oh man, she's really good at this, this, and this, I think Silva's just better in most areas. So I am going to take Karine Silva here. I do like the under two and a half though, because there is a world where Souza lands a big shot puts Karine Silva out. Um, the under two and a half is probably the better play, but Karine Silva is my pick. Let me know what you have, and I will see Light. you in the The men's time. flyweights are up next. We have Tim Elliott taking on Victor Altamirano. Altamirano is 4-1 in the last five, 3-2 and two for Elliott. Uh, Altamirano is the younger fighter at 32 years old. He is taking on the 36-year-old of Elliott. Uh, Elliott's going to be a little bit shorter here at 5'7 with a 67-inch reach. 5'10 
5'8 with a 70 and a half inch reach for Altamirano. Now, interesting matchup here. We're going to start with Elliott because he's the, the more, uh, he's the more of an oddity in this matchup here because he, he has a lot of forward pressure, but really unorthodox striking, kind of unpredictable movement on the feet, which is usually good for him, but every now and then it can get him kind of caught off balance or whatever, but he has good volume when he's striking, even though the strikes are not usually the most textbook, if you will, they're going to come from odd angles. He's got good volume and he's hard to predict in the movement. Like I said, now pardon the boat in the background. I've restarted this video like 10 times. So just, it's just going to be there now. Uh, <laughs> he's got good wrestling. He has good takedown volume. So the takedown volume is important for, for Elliot because if he doesn't get the first takedown, he's going to try another and another and another and another. And that's just what happens because Elliot's going to have a high pace and high pressure with those, those takedowns while mixing the strikes, the uh, unorthodox angles and things like that while he's doing so. When he does get to the mat, he's very much submission over position, trying to get the finish. No big deal because if he if it goes back to the feet, he's just going to jump back on you and try to get that takedown again with more uh, with more pressure. So hard style to prepare for, but Victor Altamirano is pretty darn good. He's got good striking. He's very accurate. He does not waste his strikes. He, and that's strange because he's a guy with a lot of volume, but if you look at his striking numbers, he's accurate in his, in his percentages. Now, power is there as well. He's going to throw in combination, and he's going to mix in his punches and kicks. So the, the, it's important because a lot of fighters, they're like, oh, this is a boxing combo now. Oh, now I'm kicking. He will put those together in the same combination, and that's very important in a matchup like this because a guy like Tim Elliott, who's constantly moving around, using that unorthodox footwork, having the punches and kicks coming back at him is going to make that harder for him to really know whether he needs to go under the punches or whether he needs to circle outside or what he needs to do. It's going to be harder to figure that out when you have the combination of the two. Now, the problem for Altamirano is his striking defense isn't the greatest and he will get hit. He's he's actually very hittable. And for a guy like Elliot, who's going to be thrown at odd angles, he's probably going to be able to land some shots on the feet. Now, when it comes to the mat, if Altamirano is taken down, he does have decent jujitsu, but his primary goal is to get back to his feet, which I like in this matchup here. This is a very tough matchup. And I know a lot of people were talking about the, the Elliot situation where his uh, his wife was hooking up with his best man on a wedding night and all that stuff. And that sucks. Don't get me wrong. But like, this is a fight that has nothing to do with, with that specific moment unless his head's not right or whatever. Or it, I don't think it's going to give him extra motivation. I know people have been saying that. I don't know. I think Altamirano is going to be the better fighter here. I think he's better on the feet. I think if it gets to the mat, he's going to be able to work back to his feet. But the one thing that I will mention is Elliot's a dirty fighter. Dude's going to be hooking your gloves, you know, doing all these, you know, whatever he's going to be checking your oil, whatever he's got to do. Elliot's a dirty fighter, and that just is the way that it is. Some people like him for it. Some people dislike him for it. He could use that to his advantage, but I'm taking Elsa Murano. I think he's going to be able to land some good shots on the feet, do the more damaging strikes, and I think if it does end up on the mat, he's going to be able to get back to his feet and get back to what he's good at. So as much as it sucks for Elliot. I'm not picking him. I know everybody else is. Let's go, Altamirano. I'll see you guys in the next We've fight. got a short notice matchup here. Jim Miller, who was originally on the card, is now fighting Jared Gordon, who is not on the card, stepping in short notice after his no contest fight with Bobby Green, where he was knocked out uh, with a headbutt. So, or well, the headbutt didn't knock him out, but the headbutt set up the knockout, whatever. Either way, ended up in a knockout with a no contest. So Jared Gordon coming in 2-2 and one no contest in his last five. Three and two on the Miller side. Now, Miller bit older at 39 years old as opposed to a 34 for Gordon but both guys are veterans of the sport veterans of the UFC uh for this one here let's start with Jim Miller he's got good striking uh it's kind of just developed as his career has gone on his striking seems to have gotten better he does work the leg kick very well and he's got decent power at this point in his career the grappling though is what he was known for earlier in his career and it's still there he does have good grappling very solid guillotine that is probably his best weapon it's it's he's quick on it um and one thing i've always thought about jim miller is that his fight iq is usually usually pretty on point he's usually you know keeping things smart sharp all that good stuff so i do like all those things about jim miller now on the jared gordon side there's a lot of things i like about him as well He's going to come forward with forward pressure, and he's got pretty good striking, but particularly that lead hook. His lead hook is what lands in most of his matchups if he's going to do any damage in the striking as that lead hook. Now with the grappling, he's pretty darn good there, and he's solid at the cage push, where he can push you up against the cage, win minutes, kind of use his dirty boxing, you know, mix in the takedowns, whatever he's got to do. Seriously, this matchup is actually really close, and I'm probably going to pick somebody a little bit different than what you're expecting, but I'm going to take Jim Miller... For the simple fact that the short notice, the recent knockout, I just 
I think Jim Miller probably gets this one done, whether it's by knockout or a club and sub. I do think he's going to get the finish as well. So uh, something you might want to play is the fight doesn't go to decision. That's kind of where I'm leaning, but I might also just take Jim Miller inside the distance. If I end up betting it, I might also pass. I don't know. This is one of those bites where we're sitting back and just watching it, maybe kicking your feet up on the coffee table, crack it open a nice cold root beer, and just having a good time. This is the kind of fight like, that I would like to do that. But if I am to bet... I am going to take Jim Miller. Let me know what you guys have, and I'll see All you All the way up at the co-main event now. And you know what? Do me a favor. If you haven't done it already, like the video. I appreciate it very much. It does help the channel a lot. It's, it's the reason we've grown this much in this short amount of time. We've been doing this darn thing for about nine months. We hit the thousand mark. That is because of you guys. So please keep liking these videos. Subscribe if you want to see more of this. But the liking the videos is what I'm asking of you but now that we've hit a thousand anyway. So, you know, all that good stuff. Let's go ahead and break down this featherweight matchup between Alex Caceres and Daniel Pineda. Now, real quick, a caveat here. I am a bit biased because I am a big Bruce Leroy fan. So if you watched my favorite fighters video, you'll know that I am a big Bruce Leroy fan. There you go. Now in this one here, Alex Caceres, four and one in his last five. Daniel Pineda, two, one and two no contests in his last five fights. Dude just keeps popping for PEDs. Um, but he did look renewed in his last matchup. So that's something to point out. His last fight, he looked like a new man. Uh, you know, whatever. The guy's 37, though. So he's getting up there. He's going against the 34-year-old Alex Caceres. Both guys very experienced. Uh, once again, guys, I pardon me for the boats. Uh, it is Memorial Day while I'm recording this. And if you are from the United States, you know Memorial Day, for whatever reason, has become a holiday where people decide that instead of using the, the holiday for its purpose, it's to get drunk and drive boats and I happen to live by a river, so even though I'm in the middle of nowhere, there are boats going by. There's my tangent over. I'm super annoyed with the boats, if you can't tell. Now, back to the fights. Uh, 34 and 37, but both guys are very experienced in their careers. Both guys with, obviously, over 20 wins and over 10 losses. That's, you know, not usually a good spot, but good spot. But you know what? Both guys have fought some of the best competition around. Now, Caceres, he is 5'10 with a 73 and a half inch reach as opposed to 5'7 with a 70 inch reach for Pineda. So Caceres is kind of the longer, lankier fighter for 145. He, he typically is going to be the taller guy, but he's got a pretty big size advantage as far as height and reach in Pineda or against Pineda. But Pineda is going to be the thicker, more dense fighter, and that's going to show in his power. So if we look at the power striking of Pineda, he's looking for that finish on the feet. And when it gets to the mat, he's going to shoot those takedowns look to get it to the mat because it's grappling he's going to look for the submissions there and he is very very good at it every single one of 20 the 28 wins for Pineda have been inside the distance he is a finisher through and through he's going to start quick look for the finish and once he gets the fight to the mat the submission is where it's at for him but on the feet he is not lost if you will he's got good power and that's another way he can get the finish in a matchup well in any matchup but especially in a matchup against a guy like Caceres who he is, uh, you know, pretty good everywhere, honestly. He's got good timing on his takedowns. When he gets into the mat, he does have sl slick Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but it's probably because he's got them long choking arms. Those th long, thin forearms slip right under the chin. You've heard me mention it before, the choking arms. He's got them, and that's going to help him out in a matchup where he's going to probably end up in some sort of grappling exchange with Pineda. Who's going to win that? I don't know. That's a tough one because they're both very skilled grapplers. When it comes to the striking, though, skill for skill... Caceres all day. Power? Not a chance. He doesn't have a whole lot in the way of power, but sometimes you can make up for the lack of power with accuracy and timing. And that, those are two things that Alex Caceres has. He's good at moving on the feet, he's got good, uh, good accuracy, and he's got good timing that make up for his lack of power. And his striking defense is pretty good as well. Now, who's going to have the better gas tank? Well, that's going to be Caceres because Daniel Pineda is kill or be killed from start to finish. Dude comes out of the gate just 100%, and his cardio is going to fade as the fight goes on. One way or another, somebody's probably getting the finish here. I like the under two and a half rounds, or even better, I like the fight does not go to, the dis go to decision. Um, I'm going to pick Alex Caceres for two reasons. One, because I like Alex Caceres. And two, because Bruce Leroy seems to be on a different level now. He is, in his last five fights, he's four and one. But if you look at his, his recent resume, four and one doesn't do it justice. He has very few losses in his last, what, 10 fights? The dude's been looking very good lately, and he's just improved over the years. He's been in the UFC since 2010. little context for you. I graduated high school in 2010. Dude's been in the UFC since I was in high school. That's crazy. So 
for Alex Caceres, he's been fighting the top level competition forever now. I'm taking him to win this fight. I also am a fan of the guy. So let me know what you've got. Let me know who your pick is in the comments below. And I will see you in the main event. We have finally made it to the main event of the evening. And this is your last reminder to hit that like button for me. I appreciate it very much. We have a flyweight main event between Amir Albazi and Kai Kara France. Kai Kara France, three and two in his last five fights, five and oh for Amir Albazi. And the first thing I want to mention is the under four and a half. If you can get the under four and a half line, I feel like that's an easy one. In flyweights, tend to finish fights at a higher percentage than most other weight classes or than a lot of other weight classes anyway. And you got a guy in Albazi who, if it gets to the mat, is going to get the finish there or most likely. But if it stays on the feet, we got a guy in Car France who's going to be able to get the finish there most likely. So I think the under four and a half is a good play. I'm playing it myself. I like that a lot. Now let's break down this matchup. Kai Car France, he's a very solid striker. He's got some of the fastest hands in the division. Maybe not the fastest, but some of. Um, he's also going to be slamming leg kicks. He's got good power and he's got movement on the feet that makes him hard to, you know, hard to land on and hard to take down because he's going to be moving, slamming his shots, moving sideways, whatever, hitting them leg kicks and just doing what he's got to do. If he does get taken down, he does work back to his feet, but he is hard to take down because that takedown defense is pretty gosh darn good. Now, for the Albazi side, he's you know, good striker. He's got a good jab, all that good stuff. His striking has improved quite a bit over his career, especially as of late, but his grappling is where he gets it done. He's a solid grappler who's just constantly transitioning positions to work to a better spot. And while he's doing so, he's threatening with submissions constantly because, well, guess what? The guy's looking for the sub and that's what he's probably going to do in most fights to get the win. He has good timing on his takedowns, so against a guy like Cara France, that's going to be interesting because can he time that movement? Can he time maybe that leg kick, get the takedown that way? How is that going to work for Albazi? Because Cara France is very hard to take down, but Albazi, if he gets it to the mat, that is clearly his best path, best path to victory. This is a very, very interesting matchup because like I said, it's striker versus grappler. It's, you know, the guy on the feet probably going to get the knockout or the guy on the ground probably going to get the submission. Under four and a half is my favorite bet on this fight. And I've already pointed that out. But for the sake of a pick, I'm going to go against the grain. I know a lot of people are on the Car France side. I like Amir Albazi here to get it done. Maybe it's because I favor grapplers over strikers. Maybe it's just because, you know, I think Amir Albazi has got some serious, serious potential to kind of rise through the ranks and get that title shot pretty soon. So I'm taking Amir Albazi. Let me know what, you, what you've what you got. And you know what? I appreciate all of you guys for tuning in. Thank you so much for doing so. And I will see you on the next breakdown. Oh, also in the comments, let me know which, if you liked the, uh, the new intro and go check out Coltero and the Weird Ciders. Thanks. See you later.